things that we're aware of and things that we're not aware of. You're working on our behalf and in our behalf all the time. And certainly you've made uh, a way of escape from this world possible through your plan of salvation. So thank you and praise you for all those wonderful things. And we do ask and pray that now as we come to you in prayer and open your word that you'll be here to instruct us and to guide and direct. Mm -hmm. We want to dig into uh, the marvelous things that your word has for us. We ask and pray a blessing on all those <clears throat> that are tuning in uh, by the internet and of course us here as well. Guide and direct us, Lord, uh, throughout the entire day we receive the blessing you have for us. So we ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Okay, so I sound a little, little, little congested it's because I am kind of just working with one hole in my head today, this morning. So. But I think what we're going to be doing this morning is starting a story. Are we going to start a story this morning? Yeah, a story we're going to start. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do that and take... Uh, Guys, there was missing story time? <laughs> I was. Everybody was. <laughs> we'll see how we go with, with that and uh, <clears throat> then we'll jump back into our lesson. Okay. Now this one, I don't ordinarily recommend fiction, but this is more of like an allegory. This is a novel that was written that illustrates some strong Christian principles. And I read this to the kids when they were younger, and they really were blessed by it. But well, I will tell you, it's written a lot like um, a movie script or a TV script, in that you'll have one chapter that will deal with one thing that's happening, and the next chapter may deal with some other people that some other things are happening to. And at, it's only as you begin to get used to the ebb and flow that you begin to see where the storylines connect. But you basically have three different scenarios. You have the <coughs> spiritual realm of what's happening behind the scenes. You have the physical realm. And then you also have this political realm where you'll see there's things happening in the government and in leadership. So you begin to see that all of these things are connected and that the Lord is working behind the scenes in all of them. And really, the basis for it is, is Ephesians chapter right. 4 or 6, where it talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so the spiritual battle is raging on. Right. A lot of times we're unaware of all the circumstances. And that's kind of what he really tries to address there. But just keep in mind, this is this is fiction, so it's not talking about a town. But you may recognize different elements when you hear this. Chapter 1. Late on a full moon Sunday night, the two figures in work clothes appeared on Highway 27, just outside the small college town of Ashton. They were tall, at least seven feet, strongly built, perfectly proportioned. One was dark-haired and sharp-featured, and the other was blonde and powerful. From a half mile away, they looked toward the town, regarding the cacophony. Whoa, this is one of those words I don't get. <laughs> cacophony of sounds of gaiety from the storefronts, the streets and alleys within it, and they started walking. It was the time of the Ashton Summer Festival, the town's yearly exercise in frivolity and chaos. Its way of saying thank you, come again, good luck, nice to have you to the 800 or so college students at Whitmore College who would be getting their long-awaited summer break from classes. Most would pack up and go home, but all would definitely stay at least long enough to take in the festivities, the street disco, the carnival rides, the nickel movies, and whatever else could be had over or under the table for kicks. It was a wild time, a chance to get drunk, pregnant, beat up, ripped off, and sick, all in the same night. In the middle of town, a community-conscious landowner had opened up a vacant lot and permitted a traveling troop of enterprising migrants to set up their carnival with rides, with booths and porta potties. The rides were best viewed in the dark, an escapade in gaily lit rust powered by unmuffled tractor engines that competed with the wavering carnival music that squawked loudly from somewhere in the middle of it all. But on this warm summer night, the roaming cotton candy masses were out to enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. A Ferris wheel slowly turned, hesitated for boarding, turned some more for unboarding, then took a few full rotations to give the passengers their money's worth. A merry-go-round spun in a brightly lit, gaudy circle, the peeling and dismembered horses still prancing in the melody of the ca canned calliope. A lot of C's in this sentence. 
Carnival goers threw, hand, threw baseballs at baskets, dimes at ashtrays, darts at balloons, and money to the wind along the hastily assembled ramshackle midway under the, uh, where the hawkers rounded the same try your luck chatter for each passerby. The two visitors stood tall and silent in the middle of it all, wondering how a town of 12,000 people, including college students, could produce such a vast teeming crowd. The usually quiet population turned out in droves, augmented by diversion seekers from elsewhere, until the streets, taverns, stores, alleys, and parking spots were jammed. Anything was allowed and the illegal was ignored. The police did have their hands full, but each rowdy vandal drunk or hooker in cuffs only meant a dozen more still loose and roaming about the town. The festival, reaching a crescendo now on its last night, was like a terrible storm that couldn't be stopped. One could only wait for it to blow over, and there would be plenty to clean up afterward. The two visitors made their way slowly through the people-packed carnival, listening to the talk, watching their activity. They were inquisitive about this town, so they took their time observing here and there, on the right, on the left, before and behind. The milling throngs were moving around them like swirling garments in a washing machine, meandering from this side of the street to the other in an unpredictable but never-ending cycle. The two tall men kept eyeing the crowd. They were looking for someone. There, said the dark-haired man. They both saw her. She was young and very pretty, but also very unsettled, looking this way and that, a camera in her hands, and a stiff-lipped expression on her face. The two men hurried through the crowd and stood beside her, but she didn't notice them. You know, the dark-haired one said to, the, to her, you might try looking over there. With that simple comment, he guided her by a hand on her shoulder toward one particular booth on the midway. She stepped through the grass and candy wrappers, moving toward the booth where some teenagers were egging each other on and popping balloons with darts. None of that interested her, but then some shadows moving stealthily behind the booth did. She held her camera ready, took a few more silent, careful steps, then quickly raised the camera to her eye. The flash of the bulb lit up the trees behind the booth as the two men hurried away to their next appointment. They moved smoothly, unfalteringly, passing through the main part of town at a brisk pace. Their final destination was a mile past the center of town, right on Poplar Street and up to the top of Morgan Hill, about a half mile. Practically no time at all had passed before they stood before the little white church on its postage stamp lot, with its well-groomed lawn and dainty Sunday school service billboard. Across the top of the little billboard was the name Ashton Community Church, and in black letters, hastily painted over whatever name used to be there, it said Henry L. Bush, pastor. The two looked back. From this lofty hill, one could look over the whole town and see it spread from city limit to city limit. To the west sparkled the caramel-colored carnival. To the east stood the dignified and, and matronly Whitmore College campus along Highway 27. Main Street through town was the warehouse offices, the small town-sized Sears, a few gas stations at war, and a true value hardware. There was the local newspaper and several small family businesses. From here, the town looked so typically American, small, innocent, and harmless, like the background for every Norman Rockwell painting. But the two visitors did not perceive with eyes only. Even from this vantage point, the true substratum of Ashton weighed very heavily upon their spirits and minds. They could feel it, restless, strong, and growing very designed and purposeful, a very special kind of evil. It was not unlike either of them to ask questions, to study, and to probe. More often than not, it came with their job, so they naturally hesitated in their business, pausing to wonder, why here? But only for an instant. It could have been some acute sensitivity, an instinct, a very faint but for them discernible impression, but it was enough to make them both instantly vanish around the corner of the church, melding themselves against the beveled siding, almost invisible there in the dark. They didn't speak and they didn't move, but they watched, with a piercing gaze as some, something approached. The night scene of the quiet street, 
it was a collage of stark blue moonlight and bottomless shadows. But one shadow did not stir with the wind as the tree shadows. Neither did it stand still as did the building shadows. It crawled, quivered, and moved along the street toward the church, while any light it crossed seemed to sink into its blackness, as if it were a breach torn in space. This shadow had a shape, an animated creature-like shape, and as it neared the church, the sounds could be heard of the scratching of claws along the ground, the faint rustling of breeze-blown, membranous wings wafting just above the creature's shoulders. It had arms and it had legs, but it seemed to move without them, crossing the street and mounting the front steps of the church. Its leering, bulbous eyes reflected the stark blue light of the full moon with their own jaundiced glow. The gnarled head protruded from hunched shoulders and wisps of rancid red breath seethed and labored get hisses through rows of jagged fangs. It either laughed or it coughed. The wheezing puffed from deep within its throat could have been either. From its crawling position, it reared up on its legs and looked about the quiet neighborhood, the black leathery jowls pulling back into a hideous death mask grin, and it moved toward the front door. The black hand passed through the door like a spear through liquid. The body hobbled forward and penetrated the door, but only halfway. Suddenly, as if colliding with a speeding wall, the creature was knocked backwards and into a raging tumble down the steps the glowing red breath menacing a corkscrew tail through the air. With an eerie cry of rage and indignation, it gathered itself up off the sidewalk and stared at the strange door that would not let it pass through. Then the membranes on its back began to billow, enfolding great bodies of air, and it flew, into, flew with a roar headlong into the door, through the door, into the foyer, and into a cloud of white hot light. The creature screamed and covered its eyes and then felt itself being grabbed by, huge, powerful, by a huge, powerful vice of a hand. In an instant, it was hurling through space like a rag doll, outside again, forcefully ousted. The wings hummed in a blur as it banked sharply in a flying turn and headed for the door again, red vapors chugging in dashes and streaks from its nostrils, talons bared and poised for attack, a ghostly siren of a scream rising in its throat. Like an arrow through a target, like a bullet through a board, it streaked through the door and instantly felt its insides tearing loose. There was an explosion of suffocating vapor, one final scream, and the flailing of withering arms and legs. And there was nothing at all except the ebbing stench of sulfur and two strangers suddenly inside the church. The big blonde man replaced a shining sword as the white light that surrounded him faded away. A spirit of harassment, he asked or doubt or fear, who knows? And that was one of the smaller ones? I've not seen one smaller. No, indeed, and just how many would you say there are? More, much, much more than we, and everywhere, never idle. So I've seen the big man sighed. But what are they doing here? We've never seen such concentration before, not here. Oh, the reason won't be hidden for long. He looked through the foyer doors and toward the sanctuary. Let's see this man of God. They turned from the door and walked through the small foyer. The bulletin board on the wall carried requests for groceries for a needy family, some babysitting and prayer for a sick missionary. A large bill announced a congregational business meeting for next Friday. On the other wall, a record of weekly offerings indicated the offerings were down from last week. So was the attendance, down from 61 to 42. Down the short, narrow aisle they went, past the orderly racks of dark stained plank and slat pews, toward the front of the sanctuary, where one small spotlight illuminated a rustic two-by-four cross hanging above the baptistry. In the center of the worn carpeted platform stood the little sacred desk, a pulpit with a, laid Bible, a Bible laid open on it. These were humble furnishings, functional but not elaborate revealing either humility on the part of the people or neglect. Then the first sound was added to the picture, a soft muffled sobbing from the end of the right pew. There kneeling in earnest prayer, his head resting on the hard wooden bench and his hands clenched with fervency, was a young man, very young. The blonde man thought at first young and vulnerable. It all showed in his countenance, now the very picture of pain, grief, and love. 
His lips moved without sound as names, petitions, and praises poured forth with passion and tears. The two couldn't help but just stand there for a moment, watching, studying, and pondering. The little warrior, said the dark-haired one. The big blonde man formed the words himself in silence, looking down at the contrite man in prayer. Yes, he observed, this is the one. Even now he's interceding, standing before the Lord for the sake of the people, for the town, and almost every night he's here. At that remark, the big man smiled. He's not so insignificant. But he's the only one. He's alone. No, the big man shook his head. There are others. There are always others. They just have to be found. For now, his single vigilant prayer is the beginning. He's going to be hurt. You know that. And so will the newspaper man. And so will we. But will we win? The big man's eyes seemed to burn with a rekindled fire. We will fight, he said. We will fight, the friend agreed. They stood over the kneeling warrior on either side, and at that moment, little by little, like the bloom of a flower, white light began to fill the room. It illumined the cross on the back wall, slowly brought out the colors and grain of every plank of every pew, and rose in intensity until the once plain and humble sanctuary came alive with an unearthly beauty. The walls glimmered, the worn rug glowed, the little pulpit stood tall and stark as a sentinel backlit by the sun. And now the two men were brilliantly white, their former clothing transfigured by garments that seemed to burn with an intensity. Their faces were bronzed and glowing, and their eyes shone like fire. Each man wore a glistening golden belt from which hung a flashing sword. They placed their hands upon the shoulders of the young man, and then, like a gracefully spreading canopy, silken and shimmering, nearly transparent membranes began to unfurl from their backs and shoulders and rise to meet and overlap above their heads, gently waving in a spiritual wind. Together they ministered peace to their young charge, and as many tears began to subside. <coughs> Is that the place for right now? Oh, yeah. All right. I will mark that for next week. Okay, so as that story goes on, uh, as the uh, <coughs> story continues to read, you'll realize that there's a spiritual warfare going on, and you have a lot of angelic hosts, good and evil, vying for the affections and the hearts of those in that particular community. So, uh, and in reality, even though that's fiction, in reality, the same thing is going on everywhere around the world. Here, Christiansburg, Roanoke, wherever you might be joining this group, mm -hmm. same thing is happening. But anyway, um, we uh, we know what the book said about who's going to win and who's going to lose, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so... a visitor from South Africa back with us today. Okay, well, I want to welcome all those who are joining us online, of course. And uh, glad you've tuned in to our family, family, uh, family room and our Bible study time. We're continuing, for those who are unaware, uh, in our studies in the book of Revelation, we took several weeks to kind of take hit the pause button on these because we've been gone for several months, actually, in the study of the book of Revelation. And this took us up to chapter 15. We're at a, a place here where the uh, book of Revelation is framed. We're at a dividing place, and we thought that would be a good place to pause. And now we're picking it back up in the last section, chapter 15 of the book of Revelation. Um, just like Paul, you know, we, we, we went through several chapters of the book of Romans, and just like Paul, who God rose up, a uh, specific person to bring uh, unity to an infant church at that time in history, uh, he was raised up for a specific purpose. Well, at the end of time, you have a group of people that are raised up for, again, a specific purpose. And they are the 144,000 mm -hmm. in the book of Revelation. 144,000 are, are the, the, the main players that God uses to prepare people for the closing events that the book of Revelation talks about. And so we're going to pick up the story here in, in chapter 15 of the book of Revelation uh, this morning. <coughs> 
And like always, we'll go through uh, verse by verse and ask questions and talk about you know what the scriptures actually mean. So put your thinking caps on. Um, chapter 15 and verse 1 there. It says, Then I saw another, another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. I'm, I'm reading from the, the uh, New King James. Yours might uh, say it a little bit differently. But, but uh, um, you've got seven angels, and that's no, that's no big shock or surprise there. We've seen God using angels, and of course even seven of them before, uh, when we had the seven trumpets. What did God do there? He gave seven trumpets or horns to seven angels, right? And so here he's using angels again, giving uh, these angels the last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. Now what does that mean? The wrath of God is complete. It'll be all the, the completion of the wrath that he will It says it a little bit differently in the King James. Who has a regular King James? I've got mine. I haven't opened mine yet. Then is filled up with the wrath of God. Filled up with the wrath of God, right? <coughs> Sorry about that. I'd like to put up with that today. Um, if you go into the scripture and you you typed in you know wrath of God in your concordance, you find numerous references uh, to that. Uh, the wrath of God has always been presented in Scripture from the very beginning. Right? And the wrath of God is a result of what? Sin. Sin. Okay. It's, it's a result of God being somewhat provoked to respond. Okay. In other words, uh, I don't think he necessarily pours out his wrath um, because sin is there, but at a certain point in time, it seems like he has no choice. For example, I'll give you an example in the Old Testament with Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah existed for hundreds of years before the wrath of God ended up destroying those cities. Okay? Now, of course, the Bible tells us, gives us the specific reasons in uh, Ezekiel chapter 48 as to why God uh, responded the way he did. But God perseveres long with sin. Okay? We don't know, for example, how long Lucifer was in heaven before he was expelled. Uh, we don't know how long it was before God really uh, uh, confronted him. And that meant that he had all kinds of time to go around and to talk to the other angels. Because when, when we look at what happened in heaven, the Bible says there was war in heaven. You know, the dragon fought. And of course, Michael fought. Right? So here's just this battle being presented between Christ and between Christ and Satan. And what was the result in heaven? I mean, Satan's arguments and his craftiness was so effective that the Bible tells us a third of the angels left followed him. and followed him uh, once he was cast out. And of course they have become the darkness that this world has to put up with. The, uh, the demons, if you will, that uh, the book there, Peretti's book, is going to really expose more fully. So you have, you have uh, not wrath being poured out so much in heaven, but you had a warfare. But down here in this planet, God, God perseveres long with those who are caught up into sin. Uh, that's because of his mercy, because he's long-suffering, because he recognizes that we are caught in the middle of a supernatural warfare. And so he, has, uh, he can have compassion and empathy and sympathy for humanity, 
Because most of the time we're we're just our own worst enemy, right? He's given us time to change and given us probationary time in order to make the right decisions and choices. But at some point God steps in and his wrath is poured out. Right? Here we've come to a place in time at the end where it's it, it's an indication that that wrath is now full or complete. Well, what was it before? That's an indication of something. What was it before this event here? Before, before probationary time closes, God's wrath has always been poured out in, in measure, okay, in a specific measure, in a specific circumstance, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's never been fully poured out. In fact, when you look at the trumpets, for example, if you remember back when we looked at the trumpets, the trumpets had an effect on a lot of things in the world, and that was a measured effect. What was affected under the trumpets? What was presented there as, as, as being affected under the trumpets? Do you remember a certain portion? Third? One third. Okay. And God's full wrath could not be poured out right, until probationary time had come to a close. In other words, while there was intercessory going on, while there was ministry in the heavenly sanctuary going on, God's full wrath could not be poured out. All right? So this is an indication here. This very first verse is an indication here that probationary time has come to a close. And that's the only way that the full wrath of God or the complete wrath of God could actually be experienced by people down here on our planet. Okay. And even and even that, it's not poured out completely everywhere at the same time. It would destroy the planet if it was. It, it would destroy the planet. In fact, uh, in, uh, in which we call its book here, uh, yeah, in the compilation here from uh, Les, Dr. Leslie Harding in his book on Revelation, he, he put together a number of quotations from uh, different commentaries, and let's see, uh, it says here, one of the references says here, a single angel destroyed all the firstborn of the Egyptians. Do you remember the story of what, the uh, coming out of Egypt? Uh, and filled the land with mourning. When David offended against God by numbering the people, it was one angel that caused the terrible destruction by which his sin was punished. The same destructive power exercised by holy angels when God commands will be exercised by evil angels when he permits. There are forces now ready and only waiting the divine permission to spread desolation everywhere. Uh, so the plagues at the end of time are or something that God allows to take place. It's, it's not he, he, in other words, he doesn't have to he doesn't have to directly say, you know, I'm going to smite this group of people over here, or I'm going to cause problems over here. He can just allow the evil angels to do what they do best, and that's cause mayhem and destruction everywhere. Okay. Uh, another place here, he's written from a, a book called The Great Controversy. It says these plagues are not universal or the inhabitants of the earth would be wholly cut off. So if uh, God didn't restrain himself, even though his full wrath is being poured out against sin, if there wasn't a measured, that wasn't poured out in a measured amount, then the whole world, as Rose mentioned, would be simply destroyed. Yet, there will be, yet these will be, or they will be the most awful scourges that have ever been known to mortals. Uh, you know, when we look back through history, haven't we seen some pretty hor uh, horrific things taking place in our world? And yet, actually, the, the most severe things that will happen will be at the very end, once probationary time closes. All the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measure of his guilt. But in the final judgment, wrath is poured out unmixed with mercy. 
So these are just some of the comments that he compiled there. Okay, I'm mixing verses. All right, verse two there says, uh, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and they sing the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. That's verses 2 and 3. Uh, let me take a look at that for just a minute. Uh, I think it's important that John, you know, he typically says, okay, this devastation is going to happen, but let me remind you, you know, the people of God are going to be secure over here. I mean, this is going to be such a horrific time, people are going to <coughs> question whether or not anybody's going to survive. In Matthew 24, and also in the book of Acts, uh, we're told that if God didn't cut the work short, in fact, he says, I'm going to cut it short for righteousness sake, right? And if he didn't cut the work short, what would happen? Nothing would be, nobody would be saved. Nobody would be saved. Nobody would survive. Nobody would be left alive if God didn't cut the time short. If he didn't step in arbitrarily and, uh, and rescue the saints, uh, they wouldn't survive. And it's, it's going to be that difficult. It's going to be that severe. Okay. We're talking about all the people that are alive. Correct. At that time. Alive. At that time. Exactly. All right, so let's look at this here that he mentions. Um, these folks, there, there are going to be a group of people that get the victory, it says here, uh, over the beast. Now, we've talked in past studies about this beast system that will develop. Um, there are four different things that he brings out here. Victory over the beast, victory over the image of the beast, victory over the mark of the beast, and victory over the number of the beast, okay, the beast system. Okay. Um, when you take the time to, I mean, that's a pretty complete victory, isn't it? That's a pretty complete victory. And, of course, Scripture is very clear. In, in one Scripture it says, you know, that he is our victory. And the reason the 144,000 are the ones that are involved here is because they've had complete victory over the beast system, over the beast himself, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name. Okay. But what do those things actually mean? All right. um, when you look up the Greek words uh, for, for, for example, when it says his victory over the beast, the Greek word there is therion. Right? And therion simply means a wild animal, a brutal, untamed animal, a dangerous animal. And so John is picturing, you know, the, the beast here as being this savage entity. You know, this uh, out of control, wild, brutal beast. And what the, what the wild animals typically do, number one is they run in packs. Right? Think of a pack of wolves. Right? Um, by themselves, they're not, too, they're not terribly uh, vicious. But when you put them in a pack, right, they feed off of one another, all that, that emotion and that, and that wildness, and they become absolutely brutal. And they can take down uh, a prey that's uh, in, of, of much greater size and strength than any one of them would be individually. Okay? And so John is kind of picturing this, the, this, the entire world, if you can imagine the entire world being arrayed against the people of God. So it says in venomous, so their bite is deadly. Yeah, in venomous, absolutely. There's no place to run, there's no place to go, there's no place to hide. Uh, and you have this, this wild animal, if you will, after you. Okay? 
it's going to be, uh, Paul, Paul says in another place that you know, the last days shall be perilous times. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, uh, dangerous times, perilous times. Titus says victory through superior firepower. <laughs> yeah, that firepower is God working. <laughs> God working not only in us but through us. That's the firepower we want. Uh, there won't be any need for what we call secular firepower because angels of God that excel in strength will have to be our shield and our, and our strength. But we'll have to be secure in them, you see. So the, this B system is a cohesion of really everybody that's not walking that victorious road. So you, you have basically two groups at the end of time. Certainly by the time you get to the close of probation, you, just like during the flood, you have those inside the ark that are saved, and you have those outside the ark that are unsaved. And who is the majority? Unsaved. The, the, the majority were those that were outside, okay? the ones that were unruly, the ones that did not uh, believe uh, Noah's message. Except we could get shirts and say we are the minority. <laughs> yeah, we are the minority. The victorious minority. The victory through the one, right? Remember we talked about... Uh, Actually, you're in the majority if you're with God because of all of His creation. You see, it just doesn't appear that way. It doesn't seem that way. What about the image of the beast? You know, we've got this beast system that the Bible talks about at the end. It becomes universal. It takes full control. Who, who's given the beast system the power? Its power. The dragon. The dragon. Okay. And the dragon is Satan. Satan okay. So, Satan recognizes that his time is running short. He's got to pull out all the stops. He's got to eliminate. If he's going to survive, he must eliminate anyone that opposes his authority and his rule. Okay? He can't be content with having them isolated somewhere. He can't be content with them being a small little group of people somewhere off, you know, the corner of a of a country or, or, you know, even on an island in the sea. He can't be content with that. He has to eliminate them. And he uses whatever he can to eliminate them. And, of course, that would be all the people that are under his authority. And that's this entire beast system. Now, it says there that the saints get the victory over the image of the beast. What does that mean? Well, the image was set up to, as an item of worship. Right. When you go back to Daniel, and you look at some of the typology there in the book of Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar rolled out this large statue oh, yeah. on the plain of Dura. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar, is a, he's a secular world leader. But what did he demand of all the people he that were there? He demanded worship. He demanded worship of this this idolatrous statue that had been, well, I mean, it was just a statue of gold, right? It was so big, it was so wide. But it what did it symbolize? Been, That's the thing. What, did, what was it an image of? What did it really symbolize? It was probably an image of him. <laughs> I think actually it was... It probably was a, an image of Nebuchadnezzar himself. Right. Yeah. That's what but, I but see, it was, it, was a, it was an act of defiance I, against idolatry. God. Right. Because... God had told him, you know, he was the head of gold, and after him these other ones would arise. Well, this was a whole image made of gold. He was not going to let his kingdom be right. taken away. Or so pride, was, uh, pride and arrogance was part of, of, of the idolatry of that. Right. And by demanding worship, he was basically trying to get everyone there to agree that his reign, that his kingdom would never come to an end. Never come to Susan the says the image would be any representation contrary to the word of God, but supportive of the dragon and his ilk. Right. Now, when you uh, when you look back in Scripture, and it talks about Adam, you know Adam was was, was actually made in the image okay. of his Creator, okay, of his Maker, made after his likeness. Okay, so he resembled him in appearance, but he. But, but when you talk about he was made in his image, what does that seem to signify? And when Adam had a son, 
right? The Bible mentions uh, not Cain, not Abel, but Seth. Seth, right? Seth was made in the image of Adam, right? So what are we talking about there when we talk about image? We're really talking more about character, right? Adam reflected the character of his maker. Seth reflected the, the character of his dad, okay? Uh, and of course looked like him as well, looked like a human being, maybe resembled some of his physical features, etc. So here at the end of time you have 144,000 who are reflecting the image of God, right? But those that are part of the beast system are reflecting the image of who? The dragon? Right, reflecting the image of Satan. Okay? Even though they'll be saying, they'll be using maybe words that we would consider to be Christian, they'll be, they'll be, uh, the meaning will be different. They'll be, they're, they're, the yeah, image they're, of their actions. Right. The image they're presenting is not one of holiness and righteousness, right? but one of unrighteousness, unholiness, uh, maybe presumption, that kind of thing. Uh, they, will, they will present themselves um, and presume themselves to be in the right when the whole time they've been deceived. Okay? Well, God's people are able to, to discern uh, that. God's people are able to resist the, the uh, position that the majority want them to, to go. They're able to walk the narrow road instead of the broad road. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because you got all these people going down the broad road thinking they're headed in the right direction. God's people are able to resist that and take the narrow road. And have, in, in that sense, they gain the victory over, over them. What about they have victory over the mark of the beast? The, the beast system. Susan says that discernment and watchfulness will be crucial. It'll be, no question. No question it will. It'll be, uh, it'll be in your mind. It won't be stamped up there. It'll just be in your mind to be. Uh, right. The beast system, of course, is, is operating under the authority of Satan. Look at the things that, these are the different heads. The, the, the beast is a seven-headed beast, right? And if Satan has any chance to try to control humanity, he has to control humanity through these different areas that are, which, which are things that we need. This is, this is what enables us to live. We have to have, you know, we have to have food, don't we? Well, the, right. the, the test at the end with that mark of the beast is they have to have this mark or they won't be able to buy or sell, which means right. if you can't buy or sell, you know, you can't eat, you can't take care of your daily needs. Sure. You can't live in society if you don't have uh, financial means, food, uh, protection, education, energy. Excuse me. These are the things that that really constitute a, a productive society, an ongoing society. Uh, of course, you've got the religious and the political uh, entities as well. But if Satan has control of these heads, if he has control of the political uh, agenda, if he has control of the, uh, the military and the police, if he has control of the economy, and uh, of course the uh, religious uh, the clergy and whatnot, his control of the church, then all society is moving in a, in a, in a direction um, <clears throat> headed for destruction. Now, I've never seen a time where I could see more of a union between the Catholic system and the Protestants than there has been in this generation. Sure. You know, the, the difference between the two were such that back in the 50s that nobody believed Kennedy could get elected because he was a Catholic and this was a Protestant nation. And it really shocked the world that he could get elected. To where now, much of the leadership, 
in theory, and if you look at the just the, uh, the Jesuit infiltration into the churches, yeah. and how many of them are promoting Jesuit programs now? Sure. Clinton was elected. He was Jesuit. Right. Sure. So, you, so politically, we have in this country already, we have a Supreme Court and a Senate and uh, the legislature, uh, congressmen. We, we have the majority of those groups being uh, under the control of the Jesuit order now, even now, as we're talking. Okay. So, for those people that are that are have you know just one eye open even. If you study your scriptures and your Bible, you realize that all of this is well underway. All of this is well, well underway. underway. Yeah, sure. Well underway to control humanity. But what's the mark? What's the mark of authority that the religious head will promote? Religion. What's the religious? What's the mark of, that the religious head will promote to try to unify? Unify. Remember, when things start happening. Uh, under the, the trumpets before probation closes, there's going to be so much chaos and, 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 and uh, upheaval in the world. People are going to be looking for somebody to stand up and take them in a certain direction. Uh, you, in a crisis, that's what happens. People are looking for answers. They're looking for hope. They're looking for a way to go. Susan says Sabbath observance. Yeah, Sabbath observance is the antithesis of the mark of the beast. The beast has its identifying mark. God's people have its their identifying mark, which is the seal of God, part of the seal of God. Right? And so Sunday observance. Yeah, the world is unified at the end, primarily in two ways. Uh, Sunday observance and also uh, spiritualism. And both of those things are, are really uh, taking prominence in the world today. Well, you see a lot of surveys have been done in the last few months about people's viewpoints on liberty. And when people feel that they are at, at risk, if they're insecure, or the economy is insecure, they will give up their freedoms in order to be able to have peace or security. Sure. And so if everything starts getting crazy and there's been all kinds of calamities and catastrophes in the world and earthquakes and disasters, and then we've got an economy in upheaval, People will be willing to give up their beliefs in order to have the, to the, survive. The, yeah, to, the sur survive, to, to survive. To set on a pillow somewhere. <laughs> okay, the last one here is uh, victory over the number of the bees. What what's the significance of the number? <clears throat> you know, that's the word arithmos in the Greek, and it it and it simply means even a definite or an indefinite type of number, a fixed or indefinite number. So it's just basically talking about the number of his name. The number of his name. And of course that number we know is, was identified in chapter 13 of Revelation, 666. <coughs> six, six. Okay. Now a lot of times people like to say, oh you know this person's name you know tallies up to 666 or the, uh, the title for the Pope, his name titles up to 666. But actually <coughs> That's only part of what the victory is. The, the, the beast system has an incredible history. How far back does the, the beast system really go? Way back to whenever it started. To whenever okay, it goes back even before the Catholic Church or the, or the yeah. Vatican even began. It goes back, you know, when, when, uh, <coughs> uh, when uh, <coughs> the fellow that began, who was the guy that began the Jesuits, it's not, not Luke, Loyola. Loyola. When Loyola, Ignatius Loyola began the Jesuit order, uh, he basically has studied into Eastern mystical uh, studies. These are, these are the things that, that take the beast system ideology back a lot further than, I know mean, you've done a comprehensive study on that years ago, yeah. where 666 is, it goes, I mean it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden actually. It goes all the way back to the very beginning. It's uh, the origin is satanic, and so that's the foundation that this whole movement and system is built on. It's built on an entire world history, right? Well, since the flood, you would say Babylon. Babylon, Babylon, Babylon is always mentioned here because right. after the flood, that was the kingdom that that arose. Nimrod established Babylon sure. and built that tower 
to stand in defiance of God. So you've got this government leadership that is defying God from the very outset of the earth, you know, being started over again after the flood. And it's totally humanistic. Before, even before the flood, what developed was a, was a society based on humanism. You know, you did what was right in your own eyes. You, you, you made the rules as you went along, right? And so that's why there was complete chaos, and that's why God finally stepped in and said, I, I just can't take that anymore. The law, the rule of law is, has been totally ignored, and so there was total anarchy and lawlessness. I've got to step in. Well, it says okay. that at that time, every imagination of their heart, heart was, was only evil evil continually. Evil. Okay. Well, the more you look into what is being circulated in this world, in all of the public arenas, politics, in television and entertainment, fashion, marketing, all of the things that make an economy grow and that define public opinion, all of these things have just descended into so much wickedness that we actually are becoming immune to it and that we don't even sense how evil it is anymore. Yeah. So the saints really have such a complete. I mean, basically, they have, they have their victory is just as complete as the wrath that God's going to pour out on on sin, on the unrighteous. Okay? Total victory, total wrath. We're dealing with the totality here in, on both sides here. And notice that the saints are pictured as, as singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. We've talked about that for a couple of years now, actually. And what does that actually mean? The song of Moses and the Lamb, what does that symbolize? The law and the blood. Yeah, okay, Moses was the one that was given the law. Of course, the Messiah was the one that shed his blood. So here you have this, the song of the law and the blood. That's the song of the, the full atonement. Okay? So their, their victory is complete. Because they've embraced the full atonement. They understand that the law. And that, that full atonement is an understanding of Messiah's two offerings, both his human offering and his divine sacrifice as well. So all of that's being presented here right in the beginning of uh, the close of probationary time. In, in chapter 4, Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for the nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Again, from the very beginning of uh, time, what we call time, God has never changed. God's character has never, ever changed. Okay? He still deserves worship. He's just, his name still de is deserving of, of, of glorification. And that's, that was his intent. Humanity was created for his pleasure. Right? Humanity was created to reflect his character. We went, a, we went awry. We went astray. But we've come full circle back to the place where God intended in the very beginning. Okay? Well, I kept thinking about, you know, you're asking about this, about verse 2, about getting the victory in his <coughs> over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name. Before those four characters. Come on now. But it doesn't have, we, we, you know, we talk about getting the victory, we don't quite understand what that means, but I think that it, that it indicates these things have no power over God's people. In other words, everybody else is afraid. Everybody is giving in to this beast system for one reason or another, but God's people at the end have discernment. And even the threat of death doesn't deter them from standing up against it. There's something more important and even that, they see the bigger picture. There's something more important than even that, and that is to bring glory and honor to his name. Right. You see? And that's what he's bringing out right here. So, John goes on to verse 5 to say, After these things I looked and beheld, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Now, that was, that's an interesting phraseology. Right? What's he really saying here? Why, why does he use, he uses the word temple? He uses the word tabernacle. He uses the word testimony. Right. So we got the three T's here. Right. What are these three T's really suggest, suggesting here? What are they actually stating? It's being the Trinity. Well, so many T's. We know that the temple complex. Well, I thought they were both same. The temple complex involved 
Um, look, right here. It, it involved the court of the Gentiles. It involved the woman's court. You know, I mean, all of this is part of the temple complex, right? So John is saying, he, he, he starts out by basically drawing the, the reader's attention to the whole thing. And then he says the tabernacle, right, which is involves now just this little area here, the holy place and most holy. And then he says the testimony. What is it? Where, where, what's the testimony? You know, where did God testify concerning the plan of salvation? Where was the full atonement accomplished? At the mercy seat. At the mercy seat, right? So now, so what he's doing is he's starting with this and then he's fine-tuning it there, and then he's going right into the Holy of Holies at the mercy seat there. That's where the testi the testimony, right? That word testimony is the word for covenant, right? And it was the covenant blood that sealed the offering, his two offerings. That, that The place of atonement is the kaporth. That's the mercy seat, the place of atonement. You see, That's where the testimony was actually recorded and occurred. Right? That's where... When he was crucified, it fell on the mercy seat. So the opening of this, the ex the, the, the actual exposing of the, the holy of holies, what did that suggest? What is that? What is that an indication of? The same thing actually happened over in chapter eleven. Uh, chap in chapter eleven nineteen, it says there, then the temple of God was open in heaven, the ark of His covenant or ark of His testimony was seen in His temple. Okay, so you got the same text basically being repeated here from chapter 11. And there were thunderings, noises, lightnings, and an earthquake and great hail. What's going on when all that takes place? You notice that, how the focal point is the Ark of the Covenant. Close of Ark. Covenant. Close of probation. Okay, that's exactly what's happened here. That's what he's talking about here. All right. Out of the temple, out of the most holy, right? Out of that whole area came seven angels having seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their their chests girded with golden bands. Okay, so these these are these are a special group of angels, I believe, right? And their what does their dress suggest? What is what is what does their very garments suggest? Righteousness. Righteousness, holiness, purity, right? Right? Clothed in pure, bright linen. Right? It says, uh, Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. Why golden bowls? Why did those bowls have to be golden? Uh, Is it just saying that they're purification and refining vessels? Well, gold, but golden doesn't necessarily mean made of gold. It just means gold in color, doesn't it? Because if you, I mean, brass is gold too in color. Yeah. And most I, of the, the temple, Greek, most of the temple uh, vessels, a lot of those were made of brass. Yeah. The Greek word suggests that these are made of gold. Okay. Okay. I'd say they're made of gold. Could know. it be because of the illustration of like how gold is refined and? Yeah. Is there anything more enduring? You know, when we think of gold, we think of, 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 of a mineral that's very tough, very uh, enduring. Not tough. Huh? So it's not tough. So it says because the ark is made of gold and purity. Yeah, so it's all coming from there. Um, well, it, is the most, it is the most valuable mineral in terms of its worth. Mm -hmm. Right. But gold also um, represents faith. Right. Because you were supposed to buy gold tried in the fire. Mm -hmm. The gold tried in the fire is faith that's been made pure through persecution or purification. That's right. what I was asking. And, and, and that's, that's what it's suggesting. The refining process. you got to remember, God's wrath is pictured as being in these golden bowls or vials. Okay? Gold's also a mineral that stands up to a lot of things. For example, if they want to put fillings or crowns on your teeth, right. they choose gold because your body doesn't break it down. Right. In other words, it could stay in there for your whole lifetime, and it won't break down and deteriorate, whereas other metals, you know, steel or... They also use gold as conductive for or electricity decay. and different stuff. It's gold just another... Yeah, what's being really, I think, presented here is it's just another clue 
that the wrath of God is severe and complete because it took something gold in order to contain it. Okay? So it's suggesting that, right? <clears throat> and they're full of the wrath. These golden bowls, full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Now the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels was completed. Okay. So again, this is a significant moment in time, what we call time. And, and it's not going to be a pleasant time for the unrighteous. It's not it's not it's going to be an extremely difficult even for the planet itself. The planet itself is going to find it difficult to uh, sustain itself. You know, in nature, nature kind of sustains itself to a large degree. Obviously, God is blessing. Uh, that's a blessing of God that that nature revitalizes itself it's, it, uh, as it as it functions. But nature is going to be struggling. Nature is going to be struggling at this point in history to sustain itself. Okay. So the temple's filled with smoke, meaning that there's no access, right? There's no ac access to God any longer. And that's because probation, probation is closed. Has ended. Right. Yeah. Just like when the door of Ark, the Noah's Ark was closed, there was no longer any doorway. There was no longer any access to the place of security and safety. All the people on the, that wasn't in the ark, there's no way they could talk their stuff into <clears throat> getting in. Right. No amount of talking, no amount of bribery, no amount of convincing, no amount of threatening. You know, nothing is going to, to change at this point. Every person's character is fixed. Fixed. That's why in chapter 22, it says, he that is unjust, let, let him be unjust, unjust still. Yeah. He that is filthy, let him be filthy, filthy still. still. But he that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. You see, we've reached that moment in time. Fixed. It's or ready or not. Changes. We're done. Yeah, that's the end of, that's the end of uh, I mean, at the, at the cross, he said it is finished, and I believe this is going to, at same. the very end, he's going to say same. it is finished. It is end. That's right. It's yeah. done. All right, so we're, uh, we're at the close of our time here. And uh, what we'll do is we'll pick up next week in chapter 16. Chapter 16 now, we, they, 15 introduces us to this event in time and what's going to take place afterward. Chapter 16 is going to start breaking it down, right? Going to start breaking down each of the plagues. And so that's what we'll be looking at next week. Um, again, this is not... This is not a subject that really gets a whole lot of attention because who likes to talk about devastating things, right? But again, what John has presented is, yeah, this is going to happen, but all here's a group of people that had victory over all, all of this nonsense at the end. You know, here's a group of people that, that are going to be saved out of. They're going to live through it. God's going to preserve them through it. But... It is going to happen. And people need to be made aware that it's going to be through it, not from it. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to be on the outside of the boat. You want to be on the inside of the ark when that door closes. Okay. Uh, it's these trumpets here. Remember, it's these trumpets. What does a trumpet do? Da, 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 da. It gets your attention, right? A trumpet is designed to get your attention. get your attention. These trumpets, when they begin to fall, you will recognize the severity of those things. And that will be an indication that a cycle of time has begun before this event occurs. Right? Before that event occurs. You don't want to be on the other side. You don't want to be outside of the boat, so to speak, when probationary time closes. Satan is counting on that. He is counting on the fact that everybody's going to be outside. Nobody's going to be sealed. He's counting on the fact that no one's going to be sealed. And therefore, God would have no one, no living person. To, God doesn't need the dust that's in the ground 
of the saints that have gone before. He doesn't need that, right? Obviously. No. Get but he's coming end. back for those who will never taste death. Yes. So uh, how important uh, our commitment is for that. Okay. We can, uh, EJ. Yes, sir. You're our prayer too guy. So hey, we'll, let's pause for just a minute. And we'll ask E.J. that mind you to go ahead and dismiss us in prayer. Sure. Father, we thank you so much for the Sabbath and this time that you've allowed us to come together and to study. We ask that you would continue to guide us throughout the rest of the Sabbath and uh, to enjoy our fellowship time together and the meal. And ask that you would help prepare us in our hearts and our minds to make us worthy of that calling and to uh, prepare us to be that special people for you that you have called for the end time. Mm -hmm. Continue to uh, to be with us throughout the day. It's my prayer in the name of your son. For his sake, yes. Amen. Amen. She was just saying amen. Yeah, she was like, amen. 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 Just the perfect time. <laughs> okay, well, great, guys. We want to thank you also for joining us, and we hope to see you back here again next week as we continue Revelation chapter 16. Um, we're delighted that you're here. We hope you have a great week and that God blesses tremendously. So. <clears throat> So, amen and yeah. amen. Yeah. Anyway, until yeah. next time. Yeah. As you read the story, I